give people a minute to connect. Welcome everyone to Science Demystified with us today. Take it away, Dr. Joe. Well, thanks very much and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, on this beautiful sunny day, uh, you're inside listening to me. Hopefully we'll make it worthwhile. Um, let me start out uh, by uh, telling you that I have no conflict of interest in, in uh, any of the stuff that I, I, I talk about. I, I bring this up because uh, today's topic, of course, is a, a medical oriented topic, uh, homeopathy, but uh, I have no absolute you know, financial stake either way in this. So everything that I say is uh, based upon uh, science and uh, of course, how I interpret the, uh, the science. All right, uh, the topic for today is uh, one of my uh, favorite ones because it is so interesting. It is the topic of homeopathy. Well, the very first question that we have to ask and uh, hopefully answer is, what is it? <laughs> the reason that I bring this up, because I know from experience, having done many, many surveys about this among uh, teachers, students, nurses, doctors, that they have the wrong idea of what homeopathy is. <laughs> Let me give you some of the popular answers that, that we've gotten on these surveys. When we just ask the, the simple question, what is homeopathy? Oh, some people say, well, it's herbs and you know all of that using plant materials. Some say, well, yeah, it's like acupuncture and stuff or that uh, it's, it's natural. Uh, there are no synthetic drugs that are used. <laughs> then uh, one of my favorites, uh, like yogurt and stuff. None of those are correct. Homeopathy is a very, very specific alternative medical practice. Uh, although I, I think pseudoscientific uh, practice would be a better description. But the important thing to realize off the bat that it is none of the things that, is, uh, that I've listed here. Homeopathy is uh, a therapeutic system of medicine. And obviously I have put the medicine in quotation marks for reasons that will become clear. Um, this uh, uh, therapy goes back over 200 years to, to Germany as we will dis discuss. And it is all based on the concept of like cures like, meaning that a substance that in a healthy person will cause a symptom, then that substance will cure those symptoms in a sick person if that substance is diluted and basically diluted to the extent that it contains nothing. Now, prior to dilution, these homeopathic medicines can come from all kinds of sources, from plants, from animals, from minerals, even as you will see from construction materials like the Berlin Wall. But the unifying theory here is that the doses are so small that there's no toxicity issue because the supposedly active substance is diluted to the extent that it cannot even be detected in the final product. Now, <clears throat> This is curious in terms of scientific thinking. How can something that isn't there have any sort of an effect? And yet we have a lot of people who believe in homeopathy and who sing his praises, who think that it's just a, a wonderful treatment. Then of course, we have the vast majority of the scientific community who says that there is no physiological principle that can explain non-existent molecules curing existing diseases. And therefore, whatever benefit is observed is due to the classic placebo effect. <clears throat> now, of course, the placebo effect 
should not be swept under the carpet. If you actually feel better, does it really matter why you feel better, whether it's coming from the mind or whether it's coming from, from physiological activity? <laughs> However, the important point to, to um, make here is that while the placebo effect can change your perception of a condition, can change your perception of the symptoms, it will not treat any underlying condition, which of course is a concern because if someone has some medical condition that could indeed be addressed scientifically, but they opt for a homeopathic remedy, which is going to do nothing except perhaps alter their uh, perception of the symptoms, then of course they're undermining their own health. In terms of uh, chemistry and physiology and biology, uh, homeopathy is just not plausible because non-existent molecules cannot cure existing diseases. But there's no question that based upon people's beliefs and the widespread use of this remedy, that it can be psychologically very compelling. And when homeopathic remedies are taken away from people who believe in the effectiveness of these treatments, they can become very agitated. Well, let's start out with uh, history because I think in order to, to understand where homeopathy comes from and the role it plays today, we have to take a look at its history. And it all goes back to Samuel Hahnemann, Samuel Hahnemann, born in the latter half of the uh, 18th century, uh, had a career that uh, went, as you can see, well into the 19th century. <clears throat> he was trained as a proper physician in Germany, uh, or you know, as, as proper as, as any doctor was trained in those days. This was a very, very early era in, in medicine in terms of, of scientific knowledge. So what did doctors learn in those days? They learned how to use a lancet. Well, the lancet was this uh, knife with which they would cut into veins and bleed people because bleeding was a traditional treatment for almost everything. It was believed that disease was born by the blood and that if you removed some of the blood from the body, you would undermine disease. So they learned how to use a lancet. In medical school, they also learned how to use leeches in order to bleed people. So basically, medical science in those days was a mixture of very primitive therapies, of bloodletting, of using purgatives, of using untested herbal uh, medications. And uh, most of these were ineffective. Uh, sometimes, of course, the patient would just say, okay, okay, I feel better in order to uh, get rid of the terrible treatments that were being uh, applied. Well, Hahnemann was concerned about all of this because in his experience, patients were not really being cured by these treatments and they were in many cases being harmed. So he wondered, could there be a kinder, gentler uh, treatment? which of course was, was commendable. He was looking for some sort of alternative to the medicine that was being practiced in those days. And that medicine was, was pretty dreadful and ineffective. Now there was one substance, however, that was effective in the treatment of malaria. Malaria is a mosquito-borne disease. Uh, it's carried by the female mosquito, only the female mosquito bites. And uh, it is uh, due to a parasite. And when she bites, she injects uh, some of this parasite into, into the victim. This is inadvertent. I mean, this is not what the mosquito is trying to do. The mosquito, of course, is looking for blood for its food supply to nourish its eggs. But if it is uh, infected with the parasite, that parasite can be uh, transferred. 
And malaria is a terrible disease. Uh, you get fevers, fake, shaking, etc., and you can die from malaria. But in Hanuman's time, there already was a treatment that was pretty effective. And this was an extract of the bark of a tree that grew in South America, mostly in Peru. Peru. It was called the cinchona tree. And uh, when the bark was stripped from the tree, uh, it could be chopped up or extracted uh, with um, hot water and used as a remedy. A common name for this was Peruvian bark. Sometimes it was called Jesuit bark because the Jesuits actually introduced this into, into Europe. Well, today we know that the cinchona tree produces a chemical called quinine. They did not know that initially. They just had observed empirically that a concoction made from the bark of this tree was effective in the treatment of, uh, of malaria. However, these uh, bark extracts, of course, were not standardized because obviously the different trees the, would produce uh, the quinine to different extents, depending on you know, how old the tree was, how the bark was stripped, etc. So certainly it was possible that uh, some people would benefit from the treatment, others not, because there was just different amount of, of quinine in whatever preparation they were uh, given. Well, Hahnemann uh, was concerned about this, and he would have liked to have some kind of standard way to use the, the bark of the tree uh, or its extract. Now, the, the extract was available in a rather crude form uh, as a white powder, but the question was the purity, how much should be given, etc. So in his quest to find some sort of systematic way to prescribe this, Hahnemann decided to be his own guinea pig. So he started out by giving himself increasing doses of quinine to see what the effect would be. He was concerned about overdosing a patient. So he wanted to see what was a safe amount that would not trigger any kind of side effects. And in those days, it was not so unusual for doctors to do research on, on themselves. So he started to take uh, cinchona to see what it would do. And at first, of course, it took very small doses, did nothing. And then as he started to increase the doses, he got a fever. And this for him was the aha moment because malaria is a disease that causes fever. And he knew that quinine works against malaria. And here he was taking large doses and he got the same symptoms as his malaria patients, but he knew that when he had treated the malaria patient, he had been using much smaller amounts of quinine than the amount that triggered the fever in his own body. And thus was born the principle of homeopathy, that like cures like, that a substance that produces like symptoms in a healthy person will cure those symptoms in a sick person. But of course, Hahnemann also knew that he had been given much smaller doses to his patients. So he figured that the potency of the substance increased as the dose became smaller. Now that of course is conceptually inexplicable. It makes no sense, but that is the, the, that is the conclusion at which he arrived. And then he started to look into other substances to see whether or not they could be used as medicines as well. He began to do so-called provings. He would take different substances, give it to volunteers, in increasing doses until some side effect was noted. And this, whatever was noted, those symptoms, he said would be the symptoms that could be cured by the substance given in a diluted version. So for example, he would take 
arsenic oxide, give it to volunteers. And the volunteers were usually his friends and his relatives. So it wasn't so great to be Hahnemann's friend or relative in those days. So anyway, he would give them arsenic oxide in increasing doses and eventually find that they suffered from gastric pain, vomiting, diarrhea. So what did this prove to him? That arsenic oxide could be used to treat food poisoning because food poisoning has the same symptoms, gastric pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. But of course, he also knew that, that uh, uh, arsenic trioxide could be toxic. So according to his own uh, ideas, he would dilute it, dilute it and dilute it to the extent that it contained nothing, which of course he did not know at that time because they didn't have a good understanding of molecules at all. So he had no way of knowing that his dilutions contained uh, uh, nothing. So anyway, so uh, arsenic became a standard treatment for gastric pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. But the patients didn't have to worry about arsenic poisoning because it was so dilute that it contained nothing. Well, he went on to do a whole range of provings and uh, formulated what has been called the homeopathic uh, materia medica. Different substances that he tested to see what symptoms they would provoke in a healthy person and then concluded that, that they would be amenable to treat those symptoms in a sick person. The solutions that he tested were soaked into little pellets of sugar so homeopathic remedies were just little pellets of sugar that had been treated with a solution that essentially contained nothing. It was all based on the so-called law of infinitesimals, meaning that these solutions were diluted infinitely. Although he of course did not realize that his dilutions were such that the fin final product contained nothing. Hahnemann I think was a good man. He tried to do the right things. Again, remember that, that scientific knowledge was very primitive in those days. Anyway, he made house calls. And one day he made a house call on a sick gentleman. And it turned out that the carriage that he took rumbled over cobblestone streets. And lo and behold, the patient to whom he gave the homeopathic remedies that he had brought with them got better more quickly than Hahnemann had even hoped. And thus came the second principle of homeopathy, that if you shake the homeopathic preparation, it will become more potent. This was known as the principle of succession. And this is still practiced today. Homeopathic manufacturers, like the Boiron Company, you go in there, it looks like a pharmaceutical firm, and they have these giant machines that actually shake these homeopathic solutions that contain nothing in order to make them uh, more potent. Now about the dilutions, let's just take a look at that uh, in a bit of, of, of detail. So for example, the, uh, the uh, treatment for uh, malaria using uh, cinchona bark might involve taking some of that bark, dissolving or at least treating it with water or with alcohol, then taking one drop of that solution and adding 99 drops of water, then taking one drop of that, adding 99 drops of water and so on. And so, by the time that you have done this 12 times, we know that there's not a single molecule of the original left because today we know about molecules. We know their size. We know about dilution. We can calculate that there's not a single molecule of the original left. Now, according to the tenets of homeopathy, a 12C dilution, isn't even very potent because if you dilute it further, it will become more powerful, as bizarre as that sounds. And at a 30C dilution, 
which is what Hahnemann usually suggested as being extremely potent. As you can see, a patient would have to consume pills equivalent to a billion times the mass of the earth to consume a single molecule of the original substance. At that dilution, the final product doesn't even contain any water molecules that had come into contact with the original substance. So homeopathy became popular, uh, I think mostly not for what it did, because aside from the placebo effect, it didn't do anything, but for what it didn't do. It didn't make patients sick like the other therapies that were being used at the time, the, the bleeding and the purgatives and, and the toxic herbs, etc. So in a sense, it was a kinder, gentler therapy. And uh, there was not all that much talk in, in uh, you know, in scientific circles about uh, homeopathy, it really was not on the, the medical radar to any significant extent until 1988, when a paper was published in uh, Nature, which is one of the, the prime scientific uh, journals. And the paper was published by a group of French researchers headed by Jacques Benveniste who at that time was a reputable immunologist. And this paper was a stunning one because what it implied was that they could detect a reaction between an antibody and uh, an antigen. Antigens are substances that cause allergies. Antibodies in the body fight against uh, allergens. So anyway, in this experiment, this group of researchers headed by Ben Veniste supposedly showed that there was a response to an antigen by antibodies, even when that antigen was diluted to the extent that the final solution contained nothing. This was absolutely stunning. A solution of antigen diluted to the extent there was no chance of any of the original molecule still gave rise to a biological response. So Ben Veniste sent in this paper to Nature. Nature sent it out to three reviewers, all of whom were skeptical. Then the, the uh, journal did something that is very rarely done. They sent it to another group of reviewers who also said that they just did not believe this result. However, they could not detect anything in the procedure that Ben Beniste had, had used uh, that they found uh, uh, inappropriate. So what they said is, is, look, we don't believe this data, but here is a, a legitimate researcher who described the experiment that he had done, and this is the result that he found. And then nature did something that uh, is uh, almost unheard of in the annals of, of publication. They said that they would publish Benveniste's paper, but it came with an editorial reservation. They said that the, the referees of this paper had said that uh, uh, they just could not understand these, these results. However, uh, they said, look, we are willing to look at the evidence, but we would like to see it replicated because replication, of course, is the hallmark of science. Uh, nobody really should pay very much attention to a single study or single observation because there can be all kinds of confounding factors. So, you, so the first thing you always wanna see is duplication of a result. So they, they approached Benveniste who agreed to this because he was convinced that he had found something that really would, would make a big name for him. I mean, a non-existent molecule curing disease, I mean, that, that would be a huge uh, breakthrough. So he agreed that an investigative group would come to his laboratory and watch as he repeated the experiment. Well, they did come. And Ben Veniste did try to repeat the experiment, but it turned out that it just didn't happen. And Nature then published another 
editorial in an upcoming uh, issue, uh, which uh, concluded that high dilution uh, experiments were just a delusion, that they could not be reproduced. They couldn't really explain what had happened in, in Ben Maniste's lab when he made the original observation, uh, although there were all kinds of issues that were raised about, you know, what, what could have uh, gone wrong, you know, about uh, not having proper controls, etc. But the, the, the bottom line here was that uh, it could not be reproduced. Ben Veniste, of course, did not take this very well. And uh, he began to criticize the, the, uh, the reviewers and, and that uh, uh, the people who had come to his lab really did not understand how to interpret the results, etc. Et but he was basically highly chastised by the scientific community because the experiment could not be repeated. But he doubled down. Uh, he left the, the French Research Institute where he had been working and he founded a company called DigiBio, which was dedicated to proving that uh, uh, homeopathy works. Basically that, that uh, dilutions can actually have physiological effect. He was never able to prove anything. And he kept coming up with even more bizarre theories. He said that uh, the information that was uh, encrypted in these infinitely dilute solutions could actually be transmitted over the internet. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, this, this uh, was not uh, looked upon uh, fondly by the scientific uh, community. And once again, no one was able to repeat these results. Uh, Jean Jacques Benveniste was uh, given an Ig Nobel Prize, which is a parody of the Nobel Prizes. It is uh, given out by um, uh, during a ceremony at uh, Harvard University by a journal called the Journal of Irreproducible Results. Uh, and uh, it is given to two people who have carried out uh, research that is uh, extremely suspect and uh, uh, unusual. Anyway, he got the Nobel, the Ig Nobel Prize uh, for this. Jacques Benveniste went to his grave uh, in uh, 2004, believing that he had come up with a, a scientific finding uh, that would turn the world upside down. He, of course, had to have some way of explaining how molecules that aren't there could have an effect. And he said that the dilution and the succession left an imprint in the solution. And it was that imprint that was therapeutic. Now, this, of course, is something that, again, is, is, uh, uh, just stretches the, the scientific imagination uh, that you can put something into water and it will leave an impression or an imprint that then becomes therapeutic. Now, he also referred to some legitimate scientific experiments that were done with water. And indeed, it can be shown that uh, in, uh, in a sample of water, the molecules sometimes kind of bond together and form uh, microscopic uh, uh, structures. And he, he, he claimed that this was evidenced uh, somehow for homeopathy. Of course, forgetting that what we're talking about here were, were time frames of picoseconds, which is vanishingly small. So indeed, there might be some kind of association in these water molecules, although nothing to do with what was dissolved in the water. Anyway, it, it makes no sense, but um, he implied that this kind of research uh, proved his, his ideas. And you know, of course, there are many other interesting questions that, you know, that arise. <laughs> if water indeed does have memory, why would it remember only what the homeopath wants it to remember? That is, 
only the substance that was dissolved in it by the homeopath. I mean, this water has been in contact with all kinds of other substances. It has flowed through lakes and rivers. It has gone through toilets. Why would this water not remember all of the substances with which it has come into, into contact? So of course, uh, all of this suggests that, that the whole theory of, of homeopathy is, is implausible, implausible. However, it's very important to understand that in science, we don't dismiss an argument just because it doesn't seem to make sense in light of what we know at any given time. Maybe there is some, some totally other type of explanation or totally some other type of phenomenon that we haven't thought about, uh, which may make sense of this dilution and this succussion. So therefore, the question that we first pose is not whether it's plausible or not, although of course, obviously in science that is a relevant question, but the question that really want, we want answered is whether or not there is any evidence for homeopathy. Never mind the ridiculous theory, show us that it works, and then we will try to explore how it works. So is there any evidence? There are numerous journals and books on homeopathy, and they publish all kinds of papers, which would seem to suggest that there's something to this business. I mean, this is a whole world, the world of, of homeopathy. So for example, in one of these journals, and they are peer reviewed journals, of course, what does peer mean in this case when the reviewers are also homeopaths? Anyway, in one of these homeopathic journals, you may find an article uh, like this about a, a proper study uh, using a, a, a diluted plant of Tecrium marumbarum, and that um, it, it was, uh, as you can see, uh, effective uh, in the uh, treatment of, uh, of some medical uh, condition. How does this happen? How can we get a peer reviewed paper that has evidence with, with a, in, a, in a clinical trial that seems to show that non-existent molecules actually have an effect. I mean, how can it be that this paper concludes that our data suggests that homeopathic treatment may be a useful additional measure? Well, I think there is an explanation that can be offered here. Let's talk about tossing a coin. You have a coin and you toss it, it's going to be heads or tails, right? Now let's say you repeat this coin toss a hundred times, what do you expect to find? You might get 52 heads, 48 tails. Do it again, it might be 45, 55. Do again, it might be 52, 48, whatever. If you keep repeating this set of a hundred tosses, you may find that during one set of hundreds, you got 70 tails and 30 heads because that can happen by chance alone. However, if that is the only trial that you report, then an observer who reads that would conclude that you're dealing with a biased coin. Of course you're not. It's just that statistically, you will sometimes get random results. That's why we do study upon study upon study and look at results as a whole, not just one study. That's why we like to look at so-called meta-analyses where researchers put together all of the studies on a given topic that have been done, which have been done properly and uh, look at the cumulative results. And this has been done a number of times with homeopathic studies. In 2005, 
an analysis in the Lancet, one of the world's top medical journals, concluded based on a large number of homeopathic trials that it is no better than a placebo. Then the Cochrane collaboration, which is regarded as, as you know, one of the best measures of whether or not uh, science works in a given area, because this is, a, this is a collaboration of researchers around the world who will look at data and uh, interpret it and come to some conclusions. They concluded that the findings of currently available uh, reviews of studies of homeopathy do not show that homeopathic medicines have effects beyond placebo. Then there was this study in Australia. They looked at 1800 studies and there have been a lot of studies on homeopathy and concluded that it doesn't work. There are no health conditions for which there's reliable evidence that homeopathy is effective. Yes, there are individual studies that show efficacy, but that goes back to the argument that I raised about tossing a coin. So based upon all of this, Australia declared that essentially homeopathy is, is useless. Uh, in the United States, the FDA uh, is starting to crack down on homeopathic remedies. And in the UK, the House of Common Science and Technology Committee, and homeopathy, of course, is, is big in the UK, concluded that the government should not be paying for homeopathic treatments because they are just placebos. And funding of placebos is not in the best interest of the, uh, of the general uh, public. And uh, the National Health Service in, in England has said that this is you know, a misuse of, of public funds. And uh, they decided that, that they are not going to fund uh, homeopathic uh, treatments on, you know, on the communal buck as it, as it were. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of opposition because there are a lot of people who believe in, uh, in homeopathy. Uh, of course, uh, the fact is that most conditions for which people go to homeopaths uh, are self-limiting conditions, you know, like the, the flu or, or you know, some muscular aches, etc. I think most people, although not all, are intelligent enough to not go to a homeopath if they have been diagnosed with cancer. In France, homeopathy uh, stopped being uh, reimbursed in, in 2021. Again, a lot of opposition from the public uh, because there is widespread uh, belief in this. So homeopathic remedies uh, contain nothing. How can it then be that sometimes we find headlines like this, where a man overdosed on a homeopathic remedy? That should not be possible because the remedy contains nothing. Well, of course, uh, it turned out that there was an explanation for this. The man was taking homeopathic atropine. Atropine is actually extracted from a belladonna plant. It has some use in medicine as a heart, heart stimulant. Uh, but of course, in a homeopathic dose, it would do nothing. But it turned out that that homeopathic preparation was improperly manufactured and it was not diluted the way that it should have been. So it contained significant amounts of atropine. Now, uh, homeopathic remedies are not regulated the same way as prescription drugs. So there's no government overview of this. And uh, therefore there is always the possibility that a preparation is not made properly. And in this case, it was not. It was supposed to be homeopathic homeopathic, but of course it turned out that it actually wasn't. It contained significant amounts of atropine, had not been diluted. In Canada, we have a situation which I think is, is kind of shameful because here homeopathic pre preparations, I mean, I really don't want to call them homeopathic remedies or, or medicines, they are given a special number, a drug identification number, a DIN number, dash HM, which means homeopathic. And this, I think, by most people in Canada would be perceived 
as Health Canada giving approval to this. Well, that is not really the, the, the story. Health Canada has several different ways that drugs are approved. The DIN number, the drug identification number is what we really look for when it comes to, to proper medications, prescription medications. It means that that medication has been properly tested and it has been approved by the government and that it meets stringent drug regulations. So uh, antibiotics obviously would be in that category. So would arthritis drugs, prostate drugs, et cetera. They would have a DIN number. Then you have natural product number, NPN. And uh, as you can see, this would be a grab bag of products, herbal remedies of all sorts. And basically the government says, look, we don't think that these are potentially dangerous. They probably don't do very much good, uh, but if you wanna take them, uh, go ahead. And all they require is basically some anecdotal evidence and uh, some sort of documentation that, that uh, there's no harm associated with it. Then we have a special category of the DIN HM, homeopathy. There is no requirement for this of proof of any efficacy. The only thing that you need to do to get approval for a DIN HM is to make sure that there is no ingredient in there that is diluted to the extent that there's no possibility of, of, of harm. Very easy to get something approved as a homeopathic remedy as marketplace very clearly showed. This is the classic uh, CBC television show. They actually invented a product that doesn't exist. And uh, they made a bottle, uh, they made packaging, and they submitted this to Health Canada. And they got approval for a product that doesn't exist as a homeopathic remedy. Just goes to show you uh, where we stand with this and that the, the approval process for a homeopathic remedy is, is, has no requirement. There was no examination. There was no request to actually submit the product. They just said that they had come up with a homeopathic remedy that was supposed to cure fever, pain, inflammation. They submitted data that it was diluted to the extent that it contains nothing but there wasn't even an actual product. But you can go into a pharmacy or into a health food store and buy some homeopathic uh, remedy. Now, the fact is that even legitimate homeopaths, I mean, legitimate people who have been trained in homeopathy and, and practice it are against this because they say that homeopathy is, has to be individualized and the treatment has to be given by uh, someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, it's not like, you know, just going to the, the store and taking something off the, off the shelf. Now, over the years, of course, we've had all kinds of, of issues arise here in Canada about homeopathy. You may remember this one a couple of years ago when there was a whole uproar when a homeopath in British Columbia uh, gave a, a child a homeopathic remedy that was made from the saliva of a rabid dog. Why? Because the kid had behavior problems such as seen in a rabid dog. And therefore the idea was that if you dilute the saliva of a rabid dog, this, this uh, can be a homeopathic uh, remedy. This caused a big stir. Although of course there was never any real danger here because it contains nothing. Uh, but at least here Health Canada stepped in and prevented the use of this. Uh, but it was no different from any other homeopathic remedy, diluted to the extent that it contains nothing anyway. And the homeopath, uh, of course, fought back, saying that uh, she had been successful in treating this kid uh, with the uh, diluted saliva of a rabbit dog, but she was uh, not going to do it anymore because of the Health Canada uh, ruling. But of course, she believes that Health Canada is against her and wants to suppress an effective treatment.
perhaps the most uh, uh, popular uh, all the homeopathic remedies out there is oscillococinum, uh, which appears in, in many pharmacies. And uh, this, of course, has uh, uh, seen an increase in sales with the pandemic uh, because it uh, claims to cure fever, chills, body aches, and, uh, and pains. Basically, it is used, uh, recommended for the treatment of, of the flu. What does it contain? It contains a diluted version of the liver and the heart of a duck. That's what it contains. And in fact, I mean, that is, you know, uh, stated on, on, on the label. Now, this is at a dilution of 200 C. I mean, that is so mind boggling that it, it, there isn't even a proper analogy. I mean, I gave you analogies for 30 C. 200 C is, is, you know, it's like one molecule in the whole universe. I mean, this is it's total nonsense. Uh, of course, if you're an animal rights activist, you don't have to worry about this because the uh, liver of one duck is enough to supply uh, oscillococinum to the world for years and years because, of course, it is uh, so diluted. Uh, we asked a question. Okay, never mind that the theory makes no sense. Is there any evidence? And the answer is no. Uh, there is no scientific evidence that oscillococinum works. Uh, when you take a look at all of the studies that have been done on this. Again, I, I you know, point out that you may go to a homeopath and they may drag out one study that seems to show that it works. Because if you do enough studies, you will get some random results. That's why we pool all of the studies and we conclude that oscillococinum does not work. Now, if you think that the uh, diluted extract of the heart or liver of a duck is bizarre. What about a homeopathic remedy that is based on extract of Berlin wall or plaster of that wall or the cavity from that wall? How do you dilute the cavity from a wall? Why is there a preparation that references the Berlin wall? Because the Berlin wall created anxiety and therefore, in the bizarre world of homeopathy, a diluted version of the Berlin Wall will treat anxiety. Uh, I mean, this uh, hopefully you'll see is, is totally absurd. But there are hundreds and hundreds of homeopathic remedies. And uh, you can see some of them here. Everything from dog testicles to uh, human semen dilution, each of these have supposedly some effect on, on the human body. Now, most of these, of course, are, are uh, totally safe because at the dilution here, they, they contain nothing. But there is an inherent risk, not in terms of toxicity, but in terms of a belief that they may actually perform a function that they cannot perform. So for example, someone venturing into, an, uh, into a, an area where there may be mosquitoes that carry malaria, they may want to have uh, some sort of prophylaxis for malaria. And there are homeopathic remedies that supposedly prevent you from getting malaria. Of course, they do not work and, and cannot work. But if you rely on this, you may venture into mosquito infested areas and actually get malaria, whereas you think that you are protected. We have a product here in Canada that you consume, a homeopathic product that, as you can see, safe all natural insect repellent that you eat. Well, it may be safe, it may be all natural, but it is not going to repel any insect. There's nothing in a homeopathic dose that can do that. On the other hand, you don't have to prove that it does that because there's no such stipulation for selling of homeopathic products. As long as it is safe, which they are because they contain nothing, you don't have to demonstrate anything else. 
but where I, I think that the, the scientific community uh, really gets irritated and objects is when homeopaths claim to cure serious diseases. I mean, let's face it, when, uh, when they offer uh, to treat the flu or the arthritis, uh, okay, you know, some people may, you know, get better through the placebo effect. And, uh, but when it's cancer, for which there are obviously legitimate treatments, then adventuring with uh, homeopathy is certainly uh, not the uh, thing to do. And yet there are these claims, not only for cancer, for example, also for Lyme disease, homeopathic treatment without any kind of, of demonstration of, of efficacy. And one of the most troublesome areas of homeopathy are the so-called homeopathic no-souls which in the world of homeopathy are the vaccines. This is what they say will actually prevent a disease. And these came to the fore early on, of course, in, in the pandemic, uh, people scared of the vaccines uh, would uh, gravitate towards this homeopathic stuff, which of course does absolutely nothing. Now, uh, I, I think that the, uh, in terms of statistics, the, uh, the number of people who would believe in this is, is very, very small. Uh, even among the, uh, the anti-vaxxers, uh, they may not trust the scientifically prepared vaccines, uh, which of course is also a problem, but that doesn't mean that they will uh, trust what the homeopaths uh, say. So anyway, the, the term no sold re, uh, refers to homeopathic preparations that are designed not to treat a disease, but to prevent it. And that of course can be very troublesome because there's, of course, there's zero evidence that a homeopathic no sold will prevent anything and certainly not uh, uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> but studies, uh, um, keep being carried out about homeopathy, including, you know, about uh, uh, ADHD. There was a study that, that uh, was proposed at the University of Toronto of all places to study a homeopathic remedy uh, for uh, ADHD. Uh, of course, this, uh, again, to most scientists seemed bizarre. But here the researchers claim, look, this uh, hasn't been studied before. Uh, let's just see what, what happens. They didn't say they believe it or not believe it. They said, let's just do this to see what happens. And uh, as far as I know, nothing ever came of this study that was, uh, that was pro proposed. Uh, I think it would have been a total waste of money to pursue this. But homeopathy does persist in the minds of, of many people. And why is that the case? Obviously, there is the placebo effect. If you think that something will do good for you, uh, it just may. It will not cure the disease, but it may just change the way that you feel about it, the way you perceive it. And then there is what we call regression to the mean. And I think this is one of the uh, most important uh, explanations for the belief in, in homeopathy. First of all, let's, let's uh, get one thing clear that when uh, people go for a homeopathic remedy, they usually are not suffering from a life-threatening disease. It's mostly nagging pains and things like you know, arthritis, uh, um, uh, runny noses, you know, the flu-like symptoms. The fact is that we suffer from these kind of conditions all the time. Uh, we have aches and pains. People with arthritis uh, very often have cyclical fluctuations. They'll have some days when they feel good, some weeks when they feel good, other weeks not. So these are just random fluctuations. However, if you have symptoms and you take a remedy 
and you get better, it is very tempting to assume that it was because of what you took, not that it was due to the natural fluctuation. If you have no benefit, then you never give it a second thought. You never tell anyone about it. But if you've benefited or think you've benefited, you may think about it, believe it, talk to people about it. So this is regression to the mean that uh, uh, conditions have their ups and downs. And when you take something at a down, it's very likely that you will feel better because it's a cyclical condition, but you'll feel better because of the cycle, not because of whatever was taken. In some cases, people who go to a homeopath will also be taking uh, normal medications. And uh, they just would rather give the credit to the homeopathic treatment. Now, sometimes a homeopath will uh, offer advice on, on lifestyle, tell people to exercise, tell people to stay away from, from uh, uh, processed foods, to eat more fruits and vegetables. Uh, so, you know, that, that can be beneficial. And also very often uh, people who uh, seek advice from a homeopath do so because they, they fear conventional treatments. Because let's face it, it, it is a lot more seductive to take a, a little pellet of, of sugar that will certainly not cause you any side effects than to have to undergo some sort of conventional uh, treatment. So um, here, I, I, I think we've given you kind of an overall picture of homeopathy from the beginning when Hahnemann came up with the original idea, when he took quinine in increasing doses, got a fever, and from that concluded that like cures like. <laughs> now there is a footnote to this story. In 1991, Professor, Professor Hoff tried to duplicate Hahnemann's original trial and found that even when he took increasing doses of quinine, he did not develop a fever. So essentially, the original observation upon which the bizarre theory of homeopathy was built cannot be reproduced. Anyway, uh, Hahnemann uh, uh, died. He is uh, uh, buried in a, a cemetery in, uh, in uh, Paris. And uh, he is still worshiped by many people who believe in homeopathy, uh, despite the fact that there have been hundreds of trials uh, that have failed to deliver the evidence, but doesn't seem to make a difference. Finally, believe it or not, there's even a monument to Hahnemann in Washington, DC. It is a rather a pretty monument and it is just a few blocks from the White House. And it was erected at the bequest of the American homeopathic community in the year 1900. And uh, as you can see, the statue says simula similibus colantur, which of course is the classic expression of homeopathy uh, that like cures like. And at the back of the statue, uh, Samuel Hahnemann is uh, described as doctor in medicine, which of course he, he was leader of the great medical uh, reformation of the 19th century. Well, I don't think that there was any great reformation of medicine uh, by homeopathy. But there's one final uh, contribution that Samuel Hahnemann actually did make. He found that if you treat arsenic compounds with hydrogen sulfide, you get a precipitate of arsenic sulfide, a yellow precipitate. And this became the first test ever for the detection of arsenic. And it was used to detect cases of arsenic poisoning in the 1800s. It was later superseded by a test known as the uh, Marsh test. But homeopathy is, is with us. Uh, I don't think it will be killed for all the reasons that I've told you. Uh, it is a powerful placebo, uh, but that is 
all that it is, but it does make, as you can see, for an interesting story. So if anyone has any questions, uh, certainly uh, we can handle it. And as I always like to point out, you can always get more information about everything that we do in our office by just going to our website, where you can also sign up for our uh, free informative weekly newsletter. So that's it for uh, for today. And uh, I hope that you know more about homeopathy now than you knew an hour ago. We're gonna give people a minute to ask questions. You may place your questions in the chat or if you're feeling brave, you may raise the hand tool and I will allow you to unmute. A quiet contemplative crowd. Thank you yes. so much, Dr. Joe. I, I um, think that that uh, uh, I mean, we 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 find this that that people are hesitant to ask questions on Zoom. I don't quite know why, but you know, there's never any problem for them to raise their hands in a live presentation, but they don't want to do it on on Zoom. Well, all thank right. you so much, and we will see you all again in September. Okay. Bye. Bye, thank you.